Okay, guys, let's talk about sex. Anybody interested? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, you've heard about our background, and um, you left something out, actually, in between, that after I gave up law, I went into business with... Um, I had the restaurant, and then I went into business with my son for about 10 years, manufacturing cakes, cookies and biscuits and things, which... and he... I decided to retire. And then, at that time, I had the opportunity to study Imago with Francesca. Oh, well she was going to study it at the same time. And I only went along more or less to keep her company. And I fell in love with it and all my retirement plans are still on the shelf and I'm not interested in retiring. And I get so much pleasure out of seeing the transformation that couples work in our office and between sessions. Um, it's extremely satisfying. It really is wonderful and I don't think I'll ever have enough of it. The advantage, I took advantage of the, the opportunity also while we were doing, after we became qualified, to pursue an interest in sex. Um, and this course in hot monogamy was developed by uh, also an imago therapist, a lady from Texas who was a redhead, who was a riot to listen to. Her name is Dr. Pat Love, which is very appropriate. <laughs> and she has just got married for the fourth time. <laughs> so she's an expert in the field. But she really is... Uh, next time she comes to Australia, which, and she does from time to time, I would recommend that you go and see her because she's wonderful to listen to. Anyway, she um, taught us all the stuff about hot monogamy and it is... Rela it relates... It, it uses the Imago principles for dealing with the sexual side of the relationship. Now, most couples who come to us don't come just with a sexual issue or a particular other issue. Everything's interrelated. And we find that with a lot of couples, we work on their relationship generally, and then often that will move eventually to studying in hot monogamy. We do it as individual private sessions. We do it in groups. We do it in intensives, where we work with one couple for one or two whole days. Um, it's very powerful, but again, it's based on the idea, mainly, of communication. Talking to your partner respectfully and listening to your partner, which is even more important. The dialogue works brilliantly in that, because sex is a very sensitive subject. <coughs> a lot of people find it embarrassing, very confronting, and that's usually due also, as with all other, our other issues, to our history. Particularly in cases where children have been abused, sexually abused. And they grow up with the most incredible issues. And they, of course, surface when they are in a relationship as an adult. Because all those old things are triggered by their partner. The partner wants sex in a particular way or an unusual position or some fantasy, or whatever it is that appeals to that particular person and their partner is horrified. And that's often what causes big, big problems between couples. So we try to deal with that, but not as a sexual issue as such, but as an issue of communication. During the course of the... Um, work, we start off actually with what we call a sexual style survey. And we usually send that out to clients before they actually come to us. Because it takes maybe a week or two to go through that carefully. And they do it separately, they don't do it as a couple, they do it individually. And the idea, it deals with the nine main topics that we cover in, uh, which I'll go through with you, uh, that we cover in the course of the work. And it's not like a competition to see get you get a high score or a low score. That's not the issue. The issue is to establish where they are on the level so that if there's a big discrepancy between the partners in relation, say, to intimacy, then we know that's an area that needs to be worked on. If there isn't a big discrepancy, even if they have a low score, then it's not an issue between them, even though they may want to improve that, which we can do, but it's not a major issue because they're both happy at that level. So we deal with each of these topics individually for them 
and we find that it really does work. And we use, get them to use the dialogue process. Because the dialogue process, and uh, I'm not sure if Francesca brought this out, um, is to do with the, when you're speaking in the dialogue, you're talking about yourself only. Did you mention that, darling? I don't remember. No. You're not talking about your partner. You're not saying, oh, you always do this, or you never take the bins out. You, s you say, when you do such and such, I feel. So you take ownership of what's going on for you. It has nothing to do with your partner. Your partner has merely inadvertently triggered an old feeling. Again, it's usually from childhood or particularly if you were abused, then that really does surface badly for you. <coughs> and it's very difficult to deal with. And the only way you can have this sort of dialogue is if you feel safe enough to do so. So you have to have the connection to start with and then you get the safety. After you've got the safety, you've got the communication and then you can develop the passion. <coughs> and passion, as Francesca said, is not just sexual passion. It's passion about living, being joyfully alive. And if you have that, then you can get sexual passion as well as passion in other areas if you like. And we, and we have all sorts of exercises for people to do. The exercises we use are um, verbal and written in the office. Physical exercises, clearly we give them to take home and do at home and get them to report back if they feel <coughs> like it on what the experience was like. But they don't have to do that because it's, as I said, very confronting for a lot of people to talk about sex. And I think one of the major issues is that so many people, I don't know about your generation, but my generation, people didn't talk about sex. Certainly didn't talk favourably about sex. And from what I understand with my, our children's age group, th that same issue still applies. Uh, I imagine, since you're a similar demographic to our kids, that I would imagine a similar thing has, hap has applied to you, that you didn't get a good sex education. You know, you knew the differences between men and women, and that was about it. I mean, I could be wrong, and I guess it depends on the school you went to, because maybe some schools do have a good course appropriate for the age of the children they're teaching. But certainly as a majority, that didn't apply. Is it, would that be the same now, still? And I don't know if any of you are teachers or in the education field, but you would probably know if you are. Um, but, and that's a great pity, that we still live in the dark. We learn about sex from our friends or from movies or from books and it's really highly unsatisfactory because usually it just deals with something physical and has nothing to do with the emotions associated with it. And good sex is not just physical. It's about connection with your partner. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a quickie. It's fine. <laughs> really, there's not. That's right. But that's, I don't call that good sex. You know, it's, it's fine for the moment. That's fine. It releases um, oxytocin and makes you feel good temporarily. But beyond that, it's not, it's not appropriate for a long-term relationship. And what we're talking about in hot monogamy is sustaining an exciting, passionate sexual relationship in a long-term relationship. Now, I know a lot of people think that when you're past 30 or 40 or 50, whatever age group it is, that, you know, and you've been together with the same person for a long time, that, you know, sex becomes mechanical or not, almost non-existent and you're bored and maybe you'll look for it elsewhere because you will like the excitement of a new relationship. Well, that's crap because if you want excitement, get it in your current relationship. You can. All you have to do is use a bit of nous. What, you know, again, the re-romanticising exercise that Francesca mentioned before, we use that in hot monogamy too. What did you do when you first got together that you would like to do again? Because you can. You can have it all again. I can honestly tell you that our sex life is better now than it was when we were younger. It truly is. You don't have to worry about having kids. <laughs> well, we don't, anyway. We don't. <laughs> right? We don't. We, that's not an issue for us. Um, and because we've been together and we've, we've talked... We don't worry about it, no. We don't. We have it when we want to, that's it. And, <laughs> 
And the thing is, um, it's, it's so important once you get, once you, in your inner long term relationship, if you are communicating, you can talk about sex and you can have a really exciting sex life. You don't have to look for somebody else or sneak off to a hotel with a secretary or whatever it is. It's just not necessary. If you want excitement, have it in your relationship. And most people think it's not possible, but that's just crap. It is possible if you want to. It's w you have to work on your relationship in all areas. That's one thing we tell all our clients. If you want a good relationship, it's like anything else. Work for it and you get the appreciation from it. Any, anything that's really valuable requires work. Otherwise, you don't there's no appreciation if you just get it handed to you on a platter or you just can go off and do what you want. Generally, we find with a lot of um, people that a lot of the sexual difficulties also stem from the fact that there still seems to me in this world, which is quite wrong, um, an attitude towards men and women that's different from sexuality. A woman who enjoys sex, I'm talking about single people now, a woman who enjoys sex and wants multiple partners is still often viewed as what they used to say when I was young, easy, or a slut. But a guy, that's fine. He's a stud. Now, that's so wrong, particularly in the world today. Women and men are equally sexual, and they both have desires. And what is wrong with them expressing that? Nothing. So, because we grow up with that, again, women particularly, I'm generalising here, may find it difficult to be able to be truly liberated in their sexuality because they're worried about what the guy's going to think. The guy, on the other hand, is very often worried about his performance. You know, what's she going to think? Am I good enough? Etc. Etc. Well, again, one of the things we teach is focusing on your partner, not <coughs> on yourself. So for a guy, stop thinking about your performance. That's not important. If you think about what pleases your partner, that's what's important. And that will give you connection. So connection w is really, really the basic thing. It takes you to anywhere. Th there's nothing more wonderful than when you've both made love and you've really got a close connection and you just really feel like one person. It's an amazing feeling. It's so spiritual. And I'm not talking about religion here, obviously. Uh, and religion, uh, on the other hand, also has a lot to answer for, negatively, um, about sex, because there are a lot of religious attitudes, anti-sexual, which destroy people's lives. They absolutely do. You know, anything between two consenting adults is fine doesn't have to be what somebody else does or what somebody else likes. If the two of you are happy, that's it. It doesn't, it's nobody else's business. Um, I believe, who's that couple that's here on their first date? Sorry. <laughs> well, I want to congratulate you for coming here to hear about this stuff tonight. No, really, uh, to, because I think it augurs so well for your future together. Really, to be prepared to open up and be and learn about what it's like to be in a real relationship, a real relationship, that it goes through phases, and that also includes the sexuality. There'll be times when you think, "Oh, I've done it all. I'm not interested," or etc. But as I said before, you can learn, and you can have a wonderful, wonderful relationship as long as you're together. Truly. So should they have sex on the first date? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not telling them what they should... I'm not telling them what they should do. <laughs> they what? Be my guest. <laughs> okay, well, here you go. Um, the other thing is that a lot of people feel that, um, as I said before, the guys are supposed to perform 
and um, it's people have a lot of um, things, attitudes towards uh, sexual activity that uh, that it should it, they very gets very serious, particularly if things don't work out and they're not you know you don't have multiple orgasms every time. That that's nonsense. Um, guys also are very very big on how big is my penis. It does it, how does it compare with this guy in the next urinal and all that sort of thing? And particularly if you went to boarding school like I did, I, you were very conscious of, of all this sort of stuff. It was, you know, really there were some kids there that got real complexes because they were very small in comparison to other guys, even though they were you know, sort of, you know, pre-teens and that. But it's something that men seem to think is so important. But it really isn't. The size honestly doesn't count. It's what you do with it. Exactly. What? <laughs> that depends. Okay, I, I haven't been on the receiving end, so I really shouldn't say that. I, I, bow, to, I bow to your expertise. I was generalising, okay? There are exceptions. Okay. The other thing is that a lot of men feel um, that uh, if they don't get an erection every time they have sex, there's something wrong with them, and it that can lead also to a lot of issues, emotional. Now, I remember when we'd been married not very long, and one day, it was a rather what it, morning glory or afternoon delight, whatever it was, um, I couldn't get it up. And I was a bit horrified by this, and I thought, God, what's wrong? So my wife, has, in her naive way, rang the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, the doctor happened to be a friend as well, and she said, <laughs> a friend of ours, yeah. And she said, um, uh, what are we going to do? Stan couldn't get an erection. There was dead silence on the phone. I was horrified she was ringing the doctor to tell him. And she said, what can he do? So there was silence for a while, and then he said, tell him to pickle it. I don't know what he meant by that, but anyway, uh, that was the one and only time it happened. But it, is, it, was, it did horrify me at the time. I thought there was something seriously wrong. And unfortunately, if you get a partner who is not empathic when that happens, that can lead to a lot of distress. And that, again, is, ex is an issue that crops up a lot of times. Um, the other time I remember, we're, we're talking about having fun when you have sex. You need to be able to laugh at things that go wrong, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> another time when we were in bed, and um, uh, I don't know if it was to because of the activity, but um, <laughs> suddenly I nearly jumped to the ceiling. I, my bum felt it was a bit on fire. <laughs> What had happened was we'd inadvertently left the electric blanket on <laughs> and two wires had crossed and shorted. <laughs> and when I moved that suddenly, Fran fell off the bed. It was not a, not a good sight, but then at least we laughed about it afterwards. You know. <laughs> uh, anyway, going back to hot monogamy. The nine areas of sexuality that we deal with in this is uh, desire, technique, Variety, body image, passion, intimacy, romance, sensuality, and communication. I mentioned about communication already because that is really the most important area. Um, we help people talk about what they like and what they don't like in very specific terms. You know, it's not just good enough, for example, for a woman to say, oh, I like you to touch my breast. She needs to be able to say how she wants her breast mm -hmm. tusk and where exactly and which breast or both breasts or whatever it is. Because particularly for women with their menstrual cycle, what they like today, they're not necessarily going to want you to do <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> right? So guys, listen. Just because you do it well today and they have three <laughs> orgasms doesn't mean tomorrow's going to be the same. Don't get into an automatic routine, which a lot of guys do. I'm not saying anybody here does, but that's what a lot of guys do. And it's boring. That doesn't make for good sex. 
So you get, we teach people to be able to be very, very specific as to what they like and when they like it. Huh? Um, the other is technique. Technique is what you do with your equipment. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. It's what, it, you know, how you, it, it, it's your responsibility to... <laughs> It's your responsibility, <laughs> put it this way, you're responsible for your own sexuality and your own <laughs> orgasm. Your partner is not responsible for that. If your partner helps, that's great, but it's entirely up to you to let your partner know what you want, what's important to you, how you like it, when you like it. Um, body image. Now, this is incredibly Eff um, effective against sex for a lot of people, particularly for women. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of women, actually very, I don't know any human being that I've ever met who is not unhappy with something about their body. It doesn't matter what it is, it might be the shape of their bum or their nose or their earlobes or the colour of their hair or whether they've got one foot bigger than the other or whatever it is, there's always something. I know I've got, my thing is back hair. I hate back hair. Because to me it makes me feel like an ape. So I regularly have it waxed. I hate it. Doesn't bother Fran. She doesn't care if I've got back hair. It's not important. And usually body image is an issue for the person. They've created it themselves out of generally, again, it's usually old stuff. You know, particularly if when you were a kid you were teased about something about your body. And often for girls, as they were reaching puberty, they were teased about their breasts or something else. And a lot of women carry, they, they get into that because of they, they feel that they're, they're too fat when they're not. But that's their perception. They might even look like a skeleton, but they still feel they're too fat. That's the sort of thing that goes on. That's extreme, of course. But we all, I, I don't think, is there anybody here who doesn't have something about their body that they don't like? Uh, Who's that? <laughs> who? You like everything about yourself? Yeah. Great. You... <laughs> As you'll realise, you're in the minority, unfortunately. The vast majority of people do have something. And what happens is in sex, they, they feel that they are um, not right in some way, that their partner doesn't like them or they're embarrassed to show, to get undressed in the, in the light. So they get undressed in the dark or they go into another room to get undressed and then put something on because they don't want to be seen like that. And it's such a pity because being open about yourself mm. builds your own confidence and generally your partner doesn't care. Mm. Generally your partner doesn't care. Variety. What's variety? <laughs> variety is... <laughs> what are you smiling about? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> variety again helps to keep your sex life exciting. It's variety is about different positions, different places, um, doing different things, maybe having sex while you're having food. <laughs> no, really, you know. <laughs> um, you know, having sex in a public place, <laughs> the thrill of maybe being caught. There's all sorts of things, on a bus, in a taxi, you know, whatever. But it, anything that... <laughs> Do I hear knowing laughs? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> but whatever it is that gives you a thrill, be prepared to experiment. That helps to keep your life exciting, not just sexually, but generally. Intimacy. Now, that's a difficult one for a lot of guys. Most, a lot of people, and many, many men, think intimacy is just about sex. For most women, intimacy is about communication and feeling that they are known by the person they're going to have sex with and that they're valued by that person. Um, in our work, we've found that, that there's a lot of um, research that's been done in the last 30, 40 years about sexuality, going back to the 50s with uh, the Kinsey Report and then the Masters and Johnson Report, and since then there's a lot more detail um, but we've found that there are, th the population is roughly divided into two types. There is the psychogenic 
and the autogenic. This is sexually I'm talking about. Autogenic generally comprises about 80% of the male population, about 20% of the female population. And they're people who are ready for sex any time. Right? That's what they generally like. Two o'clock in the morning, at work, you know, midnight, doesn't matter when. The other type are the psychogenic, and that usually accounts for about 80% of the female population and 20% of the male population. And they are people who need to be um, warmed up. Right? So that requires, it's not just about foreplay, just before you have sex. It's about feeling, as I said, valued and important to your partner and considered. And so, for example, you know, if a guy comes home and says, how about we have sex, and the woman's just sort of finished, the wash finished washing and dealing with three kids all day and she's absolutely stuffed, she's really not in the mood. But if he says to her, I'll tell you what, I'll make dinner, I'll wash up, you go and have a, a bath and relax, and then maybe we'll have sex. She's much more likely to be receptive because she feels that he's considering and thinking about her and not thinking about his... Um, orgasm, his ejaculation. That is not primary, even though that's part of it, but that's not primary. And, and the consideration of the other person is an essential part of the work we do in Imago, carried over into the hot monogamy. You think about your partner more than you consider what you need. It's not about what am I, what's in it for me. What can I do to make my partner feel good? And, and by doing that, you know, that old thing, it's be um, better to give than to receive, it's so true. Because if you give, <coughs> your partner generally will feel like giving back to you because your partner will feel valued. So intimacy, is that's part of intimacy. It starts with verbal intimacy and then emotional intimacy, then physical and then sexual. And unfortunately for a lot of blokes, they don't want to do that. You know, they're just more interested in, oh, well, um, I've got a couple I'm seeing at the moment, actually. And he is, um, his idea of foreplay is that um, he gets into the bedroom and he quickly touches his um, partner's breast, left breast or right breast, only one, not doing two because it's too much work. <laughs> um, right? And then... He just wants to have intercourse, and that's it. And that takes maybe three minutes. <laughs> now, he thinks that's foreplay. She tried to explain to him that's not foreplay. <laughs> you know, but, and I'm gradually, it's not easy because he's not used to this. He's never heard of it. He doesn't understand that women and men are different, apart from the obvious differences. But he doesn't understand the emotional basic differences, why sex is different for both people. The other thing is that with the psychogenic person, I say person, because, but even though it's mostly women, once they get aroused, they're just as orgasmic as the autogenic. You know, that, that, and the, w when couples get together and they have these sexual problems, they don't realise that it's not because the person doesn't want to have sex or that they don't want to have sex with you or that they don't care about you or they don't love you. It means they just can't do it. Their, their brain, their whole body is not ready. And they're not going to do it just automatically. But get them aroused sufficiently because you care enough, it can be fantastic. Romance. Anybody here romantic? No? Oh. Oh, great. We've got one, one customer. That's beautiful. Um, Pardon? Like a rattlesnake. <laughs> the problem with romance is, or there's no problem with romance, the problem between people and romance is that most people don't know what their partner considers to be romantic. Mm. Huh? It's the same thing as Francesca was saying before, with um, to find out what makes you feel loved and cared about. And we do that exercise as well, so we... You know, it may be that for, for you, romance might be um, having your head stroked. It might be one thing that makes you feel 
that your partner's being romantic. For you, it might be that he brings you flowers every week. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's different. You might get flowers and it's no, no big deal for you. You might have your head stroked and it's no big deal for you. So it's no good giving your partner what you think <laughs> they want, <laughs> what you think they like. <laughs> what did I miss? Uh, 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 Stan loves it too, I just heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love having, if, uh, if Francesca strokes my head, massages my head, I'm in heaven. Yeah. Right? But if I if I do if I do that for her, it's no big deal. Doesn't it? What makes her feel loved and cared about is if I listen to her and empathise with her. That's what's important to her. That makes her feel because she didn't have that when she was a kid. Yeah. I never had physical touch when I was a kid at all. Mm -hmm. And so to me, physical touch is the best. Skin on skin feels fabulous to me. Mm -hmm. Really does. It's so important to me. So everyone's got their own thing and part of the work we do is to help you to uncover that because most people don't stop to think about it and even if they did, they haven't communicated it to their partner. So if your partner doesn't know, he or she can't give it to you. It'll be guesswork and then you're not getting the romance that you really want. Um, sensuality. Now, Sensuality is not sexuality, obviously. It's to do with the five senses. And we have various exercises that we teach people how they can increase their sensuality with each other. And I'd like you maybe to try this yourselves at home. We haven't got room here. But... Um, <laughs> we can make room. <laughs> well, clear the tables. <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> What you do is, one of these exercises, which really is very, very powerful. You both lie down on the floor facing opposite directions, but chest to chest. So my feet would be there, say Francesca's feet would be there, and chest to chest. And then with your, sorry, with your, <laughs> with, with your outside hand, you rest your hand non-sexually on your partner's chest. Forget the boobies, guys. <laughs> okay, just rest your hand there. And then you close your eyes, and if you want to put some music on, that's fine, and you just let yourself breathe naturally yeah. and become aware that your breathing eventually synchronizes and you're breathing in tune. Mm -hmm. And you become aware of feeling the bodies next to each other. You can either be clothed or not, that doesn't matter. But it's not to be sexual. It's just to get you more in touch with your senses the sense of touch. And you can do it with all sorts of things. You can sit down and do a non-verbal massage for five minutes. You ask, it, you ask your partner, what, part of, what would you like me to massage? Your hand, your feet, your head, what? And they tell you. And then you do a non-verbal massage for a certain period of time that you've pre-agreed with your eyes closed. And just let yourself soak into that. It's amazing. You become fully aware of your partner and what it feels like to touch them non-sexually. That can be done obviously as a pre prelude to having sex, but it, need, it isn't meant to be sexual as such. So becoming sexual, be aware of taste. What does your partner taste like mm. when you lick them, when you kiss them? Are you aware of it or do you just do it without thinking? Again, it's more about awareness, which is something friendship. What are you laughing She's tasty. <laughs> She's very tasty, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and also smell. What does your partner smell like? You know, really, all these things, and we don't take full advantage of them. And you just give yourself time to do that. Again, that is also can be very romantic. All these things are interconnected. It really does work well. The last area that we deal with is passion. And again, if a person has passion in their lives about, if they're passionate about an activity, for example, then they can be passionate sexually too. You can't be passionate sexually if you don't have passion in your life. You might think you're passionate because you're thrusting madly when you're having, making love, but that's not just, pa that's not passion. Passion involves all the feelings, mm. everything. Mm. Yeah? It's really so powerful. Absolutely. And it's wonderful feeling. <laughs> right. Um, uh, 
I'm going to just finish off with one other thing. As I said before, sex is about connection and connection gives you a feeling of safety so that you can really relate to your partner wholly, absolutely. And the worst thing you can do, again, going on with Francesca said before, is criticise. Zero negativity, which is very, very difficult to do. Zero negativity is almost impossible, but it's something to aim for. And it doesn't just mean um, you don't say negative things to your partner. If you sort of roll your eyes and go, oh, God, make funny noises, that's all very negative. Try to find, and it's very difficult not to be negative when you're feeling shit or when your partner's done something that really aggravates you. If you can train yourself to stop and think, what's it like for my partner that he or she is doing that or saying that? Now, this is not easy stuff. It takes a lot of practice, but it's really worth trying. And it does work. You'll get much more harmony and your sex life will improve. Okay? Any questions? Pardon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, darling, with the greatest of pleasure. <laughs>